Hello, family. Welcome to the Explore the Extraordinary podcast. My name is Betty Guadagno, and today I'm joined by Brandon. Uh, Brandon is a certified spiritual coach and a business consultant, as well as a near-death experiencer. And I saw his story on another near-death podcast, and I was blown away. There's a lot of parallels between our own stories. So this is kind of like my selfish attempt <laughs> to uh, bring some more of, yeah, our story into the collective, you know, like this story of transformation and recovery. And I'm going to allow you to share your story, and then we'll go into some questions after. So take it away, Brandon. Thanks for being of service today. All right. Thanks, Betty. So, hi, my name is Brandon Densmore. As you said, I'm a certified spiritual coach and a business consultant for heart-centered people, and I help them manifest their dreams. But I haven't always been in this position. Um, <clears throat> so, in 2014, I actually overdosed from a heroin use. And um, But let's go back to see how I got there. So, I was sexually molested at eight years old, and I'd say that my troubles really kind of began... Uh, at that stage, um, I was sexually molested by a babysitter. I probably should have said trigger warning, but <laughs> um, I was sexually molested by a babysitter. And then um, that really eroded my self-esteem and caused me to second guess myself. And um, then, you know, I didn't get along with kids in school. I was raised in an alternative religion, uh, Jehovah's Witness. And the beliefs and the practices were much different from the other school children. So maybe that made me an easy target. Um, but anyways, I didn't get along with kids. I got bullied a lot in school and didn't like the teachers. And I really hated school. Um, and then I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and sacroiliac spondylitis when I was like 13, 14. Uh, was put on an opiate medication for the pain. And then as I grew up, it kind of escalated. And I realized that the opiate medications not only treated my pain, which was great to get some relief from that pain, but because uh, Crohn's disease is arthritis of the intestine, basically, and that it is painful. So <clears throat> it gave me kind of relief from that, but also emotional relief. So I got some emotional relief from the feelings that I had about the sexual molestation, not only that, but being bullied and self-confidence issues. I would take this medication um, and it would calm me down. It would relieve my anxiety, my self-doubt and my self-esteem issues. It would help me feel good emotionally. So I would take more than prescribed and uh, run out of my prescription early and then need to go to friends to find more uh, before, so that um, I wouldn't go into withdrawals. And I was in a really vicious cycle for years and years and years and years and years. Um, so I dropped out of school in the ninth grade, high school dropout, and went and worked a couple jobs. And then um, was in a terrible fight, a fist fight, when I was about 21 years old. And that's when I had my first near-death experience. And I just, I was, I was kicked in the face three times with a guy, uh, he had steel-toed boots on. And I went to the doctor the next day and they said, Brandon, if he had put three more pounds of pressure behind that last kick, his boot would have gone into your brain and you wouldn't, you'd be dead. So um, I had a complete and total blackout. It was the absence of everything uh nothingness total blackness and yet there was still an observer because i experienced this uh, but it's kind of hard to describe nothingness because when do we really experience nothingness right but it was just total blackness and after that i really started kind of questioning my identity like who am i where am i going and I started reading all of these books about spirituality and self-development and discovered that I had a passion for learning. That's right, a high school dropout who had a passion for learning. Um, I, up to that point, I really had believed I was stupid. And that's what I came to learn as I was bullied in school. And I adopted it as a personal belief. 
up to that point, but I started questioning that. I read every book that I could get my hands on having to do with spirituality and self-development. Went back to school, got a GED, and then enrolled in a community college. Went to a community college for a couple of years and then went into something called the Exploring Transfer Program which um, is a program designed for community college students to send them to an Ivy League institution for a summer, six weeks. You take two courses, full courses at a place called Vassar College. It's Yale Sister School in New York, uh, where I went for six weeks. And what ended up happening was uh, I actually aced both classes. They were two full Vassar classes in a six week period. And I worked uh, my tail off and I aced both classes 4.0 GPA, not bad for a high school dropout. So um, I aced both these classes and then um, graduated from the community college and applied to Vassar to become a full time student where I was accepted and given a full scholarship. So I went there for four years and got a bachelor's degree. But what people didn't realize during this whole time period, this educational journey after that fight, I discovered I had a passion for learning. I was studying and reading and had all of these educational achievements. And what people didn't know is that I was hopelessly addicted to opiate medications. Uh, they had me on um, a, a, a drug called methadone. And for those of you who don't know, this is like a powerful narcotic medication that they give to people who are in recovery from heroin, but they prescribe this to me for my pain. So I'm hopelessly addicted to this substance and I would use more than is prescribed, right? And then I'd have to get more. So at Vassar, I was introduced to heroin. I was at a party in withdrawals, you know, out of my medication, ran out early again, and they were had this stuff. And I said, Okay, I'll try it. I know it's an opiate. So I did some and um, liked it and continued doing that and developed some connections back home. So after graduation, I'm sitting in my mom's apartment. And I'm looking at the clock. And it's like every minute seems like an hour. I am in withdrawals. I've been in withdrawals for three days, sick, anxious, um, all of my self-esteem issues in my face, the voices in my mind, all of the problems of, of my life glaring at me. And um, I can't sit still. I'm fidgeting. I'm, is the, and I'm waiting for my connection to show up to bring me some heroin. Is this guy ever going to get here? I'm looking at the clock. It's just taking forever. And finally, he shows up. And now finally, the nightmare's over, right? So he brings me my stuff. And I break some out and I do it. And <clears throat> this calmness just comes over my body. And all of those, those self-doubts, the negative thinking, um, the agitation, all of it dissolves like water, steam rolling off a lake in midsummer, just all of it gone. I'm, I'm settling down and oh, finally the nightmare is over and I can relax. I collect my thoughts. But the next thing I know, I realize that I'm passing away. And then just like that, I'm out of my body. And I'm standing next to myself and I'm looking at myself. And I'm thinking to my, and I, it's, it's weird. It didn't seem strange to me to, to be outside of my body. Um, but I was looking down at myself and I'm just contemplating, what was the purpose of my life? Like, why did I have to go through all this? I was in a fist fight at age 21. I discovered a passion for learning. I was sexually molested. I was abused. I was made fun of tormented by the kids at school. Why? Why did I go through all this? And now it's over. And I'm looking at my body. And I'm just thinking to myself, what was the point of life? 
And then the next thing I know, I feel a presence in the room. I didn't see a spirit. It wasn't a person. I didn't see anything physical, but I felt something watching me, a presence in the room. And next thing I know, everything changed. It was like, I don't know if you guys have ever watched Star Trek, but it was like a holodeck where my whole environment changed all around me and I was transported to a different place. And um, it was like I was shown a couple different things. I was shown all of the people that were affected by my death. Uh, m- my dad, my mother, all of my friends, and um, the things that people said at my funeral, and um, all of the different people that were, that were hurt by my passing from heroin overdose. And in particular, the thing that really stands out is my mother. My mother finding her dead son on her couch, discolored, a corpse, with pus running out of his mouth. I had um, in the vision, I remember this, pus just running out of my mouth and my face was just pale, lifeless. And my mother found my dead body and said, my baby, my baby boy, my baby boy. And then I was shown a future reality that I could have lived if I hadn't overdosed and died. And all of these people that, that I was supposed to help all of these friendships that I could have developed, the romantic relationship that I could have been in, what I could have achieved with my life. And one image after another, after another, after another, after another. And it seemed like it went on for hours. And then next thing I know, I'm back in the room and back in my mother's apartment, standing next to my dead body. And I hear a voice and it was a very matter of fact voice. It wasn't this booming God voice. It wasn't a whisper. It was just a very matter of fact voice. And it said, now your life is over and you wasted it. And that was like a kick in the stomach. It was like, I was showing all this stuff and it was wearing me down. It was breaking me down. And then here I am back. And it was like a kick in the stomach, like took my breath away. Oh, what? My life is over and I wasted it. And I just begged, I, I, please don't let this happen. I will do anything that is required of me to overcome this addiction. Whatever is necessary, just let me live. Let me live. Please send me back. Send me back. Let me live. And boom, <clears throat> I'm back in my body and gasping for breath. So that's my near death experience story. And, uh, Thanks for letting me share it. Thanks so much for sharing. So can you share a little bit about the transformation that's taken place after? So like you came back into your awareness, um, how'd you stop using, like what, what's, what are some of the tools that you used to, yeah, break away from your addiction? Sure. So, um, I actually went that day, I called crisis hotline and explained the situation to them. And I told them that I was feeling suicidal because I knew that I may not get into a treatment facility without saying that. So they sent someone over, they did an evaluation, and I immediately went into a seven-day detox and basically had to learn how to tie my shoelaces again. This was back in 2014, and I'm 40 now. And uh, so I'd been using for maybe like 20 years. Um, I had to learn how to tie my shoelaces again. That's how bad it was. I was full of emotions like anger, rage, resentment, fear. Um, and I didn't have that, that opiate medication to, you know, to fill that hole. So I went into a seven day detox. Then I went into an intensive outpatient facility where I was living on my own, but I would go to this thing every day. Um, learn some stuff there. But where the transformation really started to take off 
was when I went through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I wasn't even an alcoholic, although I would drink occasionally and get pretty drunk, but I wasn't an alcoholic. Um, but I said that I was because I needed the help. And um, so I started going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings and I found um, a really good sponsor. But when I was going to these Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, I was kind of blown away by how happy some of these people were. And they were like hardcore alcoholics and they had been off alcohol for 10, 20, 30 years, laughing and joking with their friends, um, able to get up in front of a room full of people and share their story with confidence. And I was like, wow, how did these people go from being a hopeless alcoholic, miserable with their lives, in trouble with the law, all this different stuff, how did they go from that to being a happy, content, confident public speaker? Like, wow, something's going on here. That was evidence for me. And I desperately needed a solution, like, because I knew that if I went back to the drugs, that I wasn't going to make it. And my mom would find my dead body on her couch. So I had to figure out a way to overcome this and found a really good sponsor. And he helped me work through the steps which was like a spiritual refinement process, right? Um, I don't know how many people in the audience know about Alcoholics Anonymous or the 12 steps of recovery, but it's a spiritual solution, a spiritual solution to the addiction issue. And I worked the, that program, those 12 steps to the absolute best of my ability. Um, it was heartfelt and I, I, I went all in and it worked um and i had uh, a spiritual experience after working those 12 steps and what a lot of people don't realize is that that's kind of what these 12 steps are designed to do is to give you a spiritual awakening or a spiritual experience and even in the back of the big book of alcoholics anonymous they talk about there's a there's a section in the appendix about spiritual experiences, having spiritual experiences. So I had a profound spiritual experience after working those 12 steps to the very best of my ability. And uh, do you want me to t talk about that real quick, what happened? Yeah, please. Um, okay, so I was, you know, uh, having a rough time. I was in my recovery. I had worked through the steps and I was having a difficult time and I was praying about it. And um, I was taking a shower one day and um, all of a sudden uh, I felt the presence coming through the ceiling. It was like a visitation, like a light coming through my ceiling. And um, it bathed me in this radiance. Uh, it went through every aspect of my being. And I started thinking about all the mistakes that I had made in the past. And um, I didn't, I thought maybe this was God that was visiting me and that I'm not worthy of this. And look at all, look at who I am. I have, um, um, I'm not good looking enough. I'm not uh, successful enough. I, I'm not smart enough uh, to be to have this thing happening right now. And it didn't care about any of that. It, I had all, it was like it, it could see what I was thinking and feeling, and it did not care whatsoever. And it, it penetrated me with its light, and I could just feel its love. And it was like complete contentment complete um acceptance of who i am and what i am and um it just enveloped me in this feeling of love and that was the spiritual experience that i had and um it talks about those kinds of experiences happening to people in the big book and these things happen and they're amazing yeah um i also belong to 12 step fellowship i belong to the other fellowship and yeah you know the steps do offer a spiritual awakening and you know uh, it's not just for like addiction to drugs or alcohol there's 12 step fellowships for everything i mean everything you know and it, it really is just like a great uncovering of self you know to like walk yourself through these steps and um yeah, for me, it like really established a connection with something greater than myself, you know, and I was able to sort of conceptualize and design that 
Um, mm. Even after my spiritual experience, I had one idea of what source was. And now today through like integrating and developing my spirituality, I have a different idea and that's okay because it grows and changes as I grow and change. Mm. So I really love that you, yeah, utilized that tool and that you're sharing about it because again, you know, like I feel what, like when we share these stories, especially when it comes to people who overdose and have these experiences, you know, like you were able to come back and turn it around. And, you know, we, you don't have to die to have that happen. Like what you're sharing, what I'm taking Mm -hmm. away from what you're sharing is that you kind of get, you know, there was this life review. I could give myself a life review right now. I don't have to die in order to have that, you know, like I can see Mm -hmm. possible outcomes of what my future path is depending on, on which route I take. And I really love that you've been able to, you know, like have a whole brand new life for yourself. Um, Mm -hmm. Are there any other tools that you utilize to sort of help you on your spiritual path, developing, yeah, integrating the experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, so I said before that I was full of resentments. So, you know, um, the 12 steps themselves have a lot of tools that we can use to overcome resentment and fear. So anger about how we've been treated, things that have happened to us, you know, we live our lives kind of on autopilot, but, uh, you know, sometimes we think of what's happened to us in the past and we're still angry about it, even if it happened 10, 20 years ago. Like I had to learn how to heal, to kind of flush out the resentments, like for instance, for the person that sexually molested me when I was eight years old, that was something that haunted me my entire life and the steps helped me to release that so um releasing that facing the fears of life um learning how to be my own best friend how to say nice things to myself you know to stop criticizing myself constantly in my mind to stop trying to be a perfectionist like i have something to prove to the world Like I have to convince you that I'm intelligent. Why? Because I don't really believe that I am. Um, I had to face all of that kind of stuff and flush it out of my system, like, and figure out new ways to conceive of myself and where I'm going. Part of it that helped was to have meaning in my life, to have a deep purpose that I overdosed, you know, Um, people might think of this overdose experience as something negative, like, oh, I'm sorry that you went through that. (laughs) But really, it's the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. I was able to take this negative experience and turn it into a profitable business. I went from having no friends, false friends, people that were there just to use me, no money in the bank, living in a little apartment, you know, um, full of fear, resentment, anxiety, et cetera, all of this stuff to someone who now is on a podcast on YouTube, speaking with confidence. I have real friends, people who genuinely care about me. I married a beautiful, wonderful woman, and we just had a son who's nine months old. I bought a nice house. I have a wonderful car a garden, like any, everything that I could ever hope for money in the bank. Um, I'm a coach and I love helping people. And, um, it all, it all came from having purpose, a deep purpose, because when I went through these 12 steps, I I flushed all of that negative stuff out of my system and it was a continual process. And I still have stuff that comes up now and then that I need to deal with. But learning how to be my own best friend, working those steps, releasing the resentments, facing the fears, and and embracing a deep and profound purpose. This guy, Dr. Viktor Frankl, wrote a book. Uh, He was a Holocaust survivor, and he wrote a book about how he survived the Holocaust, and he developed a therapy called logotherapy, which is essentially meaning, meaning therapy. So what is your purpose? in life. And when I went through the 12 steps, my purpose uh, became being an agent of the divine. That now 
I'm here to, and to use my intuition to know when to help and when not to help and to take care of myself. And so I'm in a position where I can be there a hundred percent to help whoever the divine spirit has put in my path to help. And that has given me the strength really to, um, to create a positive future and to live that future that I was shown. When I had, when I overdosed from the drugs, it was like, here's a future that you could have had. But because I was given this second chance and I've used these tools, I've been able to become an agent of the divine and to really move into a new reality. Wow. That is so inspiring. I love that. And, you know, something else that I took away from your story was that um, you don't really, I mean, well, you don't look like somebody who would have struggled with addiction and I don't know what you looked like before, but, you know, you also shared that, you know, your addiction started from a doctor prescribing you pain medicine. And I think that that's, you know, a really important thing to touch on too, because it's not just like, whatever movies would make us think, right? Like homeless people in the street, like um, completely like dirty and gray and sunken in. Like sometimes people are struggling with addictions and you, you wouldn't know from looking at them at the outer, their outer shell. Like you were mm. succeeding in college, you were doing all of these amazing things and still you were actually fighting like this very strong addiction within you. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's funny how that works. There's <clears throat> so many people who are addicted to pain medications. Um, and with, you know, COVID and people dying from overdoses. And it's just it's crazy what's happening in the world with this opiate pandemic. Um, and it it is coming from, you know, the medical establishment. And but, you know, when you're in a lot of pain, these uh, these medications can really can really take the edge off but where it kind of went wrong for me was with the emotional component um yes i was high achieving uh, and i think a lot of people out there who are using these medications are high achievers um but you get locked into this uh, emotional you know relief kind of thing where when you're not taking it you're full of anxiety and um you have maybe self esteem issues. It helps you uh, concentrate, helps you quiet your mind down. It helps you um, be more social and confident. Uh, so it's a real, uh, it's a real struggle if you ever want to free yourself from it. Wow. Yeah. I'm curious if you maybe will share a little bit about what your spiritual coaching business is about. Like what is your main focus with people or yeah. Can you share about that? Sure. So um, I, I'm a spiritual coach and a, cert a certified spiritual coach and a business consultant. So what I like to do mainly is to help people share their voice and um, develop their story to learn how to use technology to get themselves out there to uh, create a profitable business that is spiritual. So people a lot of times don't know what a spiritual business is. And it, like I said, uh, when I went through these steps, I became an agent of the divine. So I'm here to help people. And I created a business around that so that I could make that sustainable, right? So that I could make money, so that I could be in a position to really share my gifts with others and to be there for them 100% without worrying about my bank account, right? So um, I don't have to work, a, you know, a day job. Um, I can be there a hundred percent for people. And that's what I like to help other people discover and to do for themselves. It's beautiful. So something else that's coming up for me, I'm just thinking about like people that will be watching this and, um, and, you know, like comments and stuff like that. So uh, you said that you sort of went through like this undoing of yourself and uh, you, you worked through the resentment with the person that sexually traumatized you as a mm. child. And I'm curious if there's anything that you that you've brought away from that that you could share with other people who have maybe been through a similar experience. How did how did you find forgiveness? How do you practice forgiveness? Yeah. So this is also something that I talk with clients about. Um, and first of all, like forgiveness isn't allowing yourself to continue to be abused. So this is something that I've run into with people. 
that maybe they're in a relationship or they've recently broken up with somebody and that person was abusive and they want to um, forgive the person, right? So you have to be in the right mentality and in the, it has to be the right conditions for forgiveness because um, if you forgive somebody who's continually abusing you, like that doesn't work because it just perpetu perpetuates the abuse. And, um, but, you know, this is how I um, forgave the person that abused me, right? I talked to my sponsor and, and there's a process about with resentments, letting go of resentments. So I, I met with my sponsor and I told him about the situation of the sexual abuse. And he said, okay, first thing I want you to know is that I'm so sorry that this happened to you. That's a terrible thing to have happen to a child and just you're defenseless and you trust the person and then this happens. So that's absolutely terrible, you know, but now <clears throat> it's 20 years later, right? And um, I'm going to ask you a question. I said, okay. He said, have you ever thought uh, or wondered whether or not he had been abused? No. <laughs> so <clears throat> here I am holding on to this anger and it keeps coming up into my mind and it was affecting me in ways that I hadn't realized um, that I had become kind of an angry person, right? So I needed a solution to this or I was going to go back maybe to using drugs. So, okay. Yeah. So I hadn't thought or wondered whether or not this guy had been abused. He said, well, do you realize that people who sexually molest other people like that have usually been sexually molested themselves? I said, no, I never really thought about it. And he said, well, that's kind of selfish. <laughs> that's kind of self-centered of you, isn't it? That you never once in this long amount of time where you've been really angry at this person and you've been living in anger and you've become an angry person, and you use heroin to cover up those angry feelings and to deal with those angry feelings, you've never cons once considered that maybe this other person had been sexually abused. No, not once. Well, that's a little bit self-centered, isn't it? So <clears throat> the point is, is that that gave me a little bit more of a perspective. Like, wow, um, I had been so focused on myself holding on to this resentment. And I didn't realize that holding on and being this victim mentality. Like I'm, I'm a helpless victim that was sexually abused when I was eight years old. I'm not eight years old anymore. And I'm, I use these drugs to help me deal with it and they're killing me. So, um, gaining a little bit of perspective from that and, um, saying, you know what, this guy probably was sexually abused and now, you know, I can picture him as a kid being sexually abused. And that gives me a little bit of compassion for him. You know, I wouldn't want anybody to go through that. Even if they did it to me, I wouldn't want them as a little child to go through that. So um, got a little bit of clarity, stepped out of myself for a minute and said, okay, you know what? I forgive you for doing this to me. And um, did a little, you know, meditation and prayer about it and really, you know, made the statement and the declaration that I release you from what you did to me of my own free will and accord. I'm no longer going to hold this against this person who did this terrible thing to me. I release it. I let it go and I forgive you and I set myself free from this event. I release you and I release myself and I want freedom. Wow. Yeah. And, and you can have it, you know, that that's what I'm getting from what you're saying. Like you desire freedom, you can have it. It's, you know, it's up to, to you. It's up to us to, to make that choice. Um, to see things in a different way. And it's really powerful. It's powerful to let go of those things that we think define us. You know, mm. like, who am I without my trauma? Do I exist? You know, like, how do I characterize myself? Um, but yeah, letting go of those things makes room 
for new things to come in, like new qualities, new experiences. If you hang on to that old experience for so long, you know, like I know for me, like I just identified as that part of myself for so long and just letting go of like, Mm -hmm. yeah, these rocks that I was carrying with me Mm -hmm. has given me such freedom as well. So thank you for sharing about that. I'm wondering um, if you can share about what was it like telling people about your experience after it first happened? Did you like keep it to yourself? Did you share who was the first person that you shared it with? Uh, I kept it to myself. Um, I did share it with my sponsor and um, a few close friends, but it was a while before I felt the uh, the inner strength and the inner confidence to really step out <clears throat> um, for people to see. And I started speaking at meetings a little bit here and there at Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. But then um, as I gained more confidence and I continued the spiritual development, you know, and I, I was on this mission to, you know, be there for other people. And I realized, you know, I really need to share my voice, the wisdom that has been gained from this whole thing. Um, and part of that is that, um, that this overdose and this drug addiction was, wasn't for nothing. You know, it's serving a purpose. It's serving a very important purpose. And that's why I like to say that this, this drug addiction, you know, I've turned into a profitable business, a legal, you know, thing, um, that it's one of, that, that whole experience of the, of the addiction and the overdose has become my most powerful asset, um, it's a pretty beautiful thing to think about how these terrible things that happen to us can become our most powerful um, and valuable assets in life. Yeah. And now you're teaching other people how to stand in that power and, and do that as well, which is such a beautiful gift. And uh, I'm so grateful that you took some time to come out and talk to us today. Uh, Is there anything else that you'd like to share about before we uh, wrap up to, to feel more complete about our time together? Um, just, um, learning, you know, how to be your own best friend instead of your own worst enemy. Um, so often I run into, you know, clients, friends, family, um, we're so critical of ourselves, you know, the, the, um, the mental chatter that goes on in our mind, um, that, and we, we don't appreciate what we have things don't go our way, we get upset. um, And we lose sight of the blessings that we have in our lives. But just, you know, kind of taking a deep breath, audience, just take a deep breath and give yourself a pat on the back. And learn how to be your own best friend instead of your own worst enemy. And um, you deserve it. That's beautiful, Brandon. Thank you again so much for coming out and sharing this very vulnerable piece of yourself with us. And there'll be all of your links and the liner notes of this episode where people can get a hold of you. And I just want to thank you for taking time out of your day to to do this today. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. All right. My pleasure. See you next time.